seized with a, a once in a lifetime, really, a generation's uh, uh, a decision um, for that will last for three generations. And so it's a pretty important decision, and I believe that it needs to be based on really important facts. So today, um, uh, I wanted to have an opportunity for members of council as well, as well as the public and the press um, to, uh, to listen to three very respected uh, city builders with a history uh, of uh, uh, doing the best for our, our, our city, uh, accompanied and they'll be introduced by all of the former uh, chief planners of our city, uh, as well as Mark Wilson, uh, the chair of Waterfront Toronto. Um, also, uh, some eminent uh, developers who can talk a little bit uh, after if there are any questions with regards to the lands. Um, and, um, and I think that as we look forward um, to this discussion, um, I, um, I want to thank uh, uh, all of the three main people and all of you for coming. Um, uh, I've invited uh, the chief planner, former chief planner, Paul Bedford, because uh, he did a wonderful presentation uh, in my community at a town hall. And uh, accompanied by some of his other colleagues, it was quite remarkable, and it informed uh, my community um, as to what the best uh, thing to do moving forward. And he is joined uh, by uh, Sheldon Levy, uh, the uh, president of Ryerson University, who, as you know, has done the most amazing job of building a university in a downtown uh, that seemed to have no place uh, to move, and yet he's found ways, creative ways, um, to move us forward in that very important uh, project. And then um, our, uh, our esteemed and beloved uh, former mayor, uh, David Crombie, not just a political leader here, uh, but a leader who has had perhaps the most to do with the waterfront, uh, continues to work on urban planning, and of course, as we know, uh, has been a teacher for many, many years on all of these matters. These are three people who are listened to in Toronto and across the world. And I think that it's important um, that we listen to the kinds of things that they have. My hope is that this information will help counselors move towards not just uh, one side or another, but a consensus on this. Council should not uh, be passing something as important as this by a handful of votes one way or another. We need to build a consensus. We need to reset, pause and reset, and think about what is in the best interest of all of Torontonians, not just 3% of our drivers. And so, or at least the drivers on that particular uh, road. Um, so without uh, any further ado, I just wanted people to sit down and now we're ready. Uh, Paul Becker is going to make this presentation. It'll be about 15 minutes um, and then we'll have Sheldon Levy will speak uh, on what he's seen and, and his understanding and then we'll finish off with David Crombie and then the, everyone is open for questions. So Paul, if you'd like to start. Okay, well, good morning everyone. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, I first want to introduce, for those of you who may not know, the former chief planners here, Steve McLaughlin, Bob Millward, and Gary Wright. Uh, this is a really critical... <laughs> okay, that's pretty nice, guys. Uh, this is a critical 100-year decision for City Council, so it shouldn't be taken lightly. Uh, it's essential to get the right choice. I have looked at all the material. Uh, I firmly believe that the boulevard option is that correct choice for council to make. I also want to say there's a lot of confusion out there and misinformation uh, going on and a lot of unanswered questions about so many details because it's a very complex matter. So I hope this morning to focus on the hard truths, the hard evidence, and dispel the fears and myths that are out there. I'm going to talk about I felt like talking the missing pieces, so I'm going to talk about five missing pieces. So let's look at the first one. Just so everybody's on the same page, on the far, uh, my left, is the 
existing gardener as we all know it today. In the middle is what is being called the hybrid, and on the right is being what's called the remove or the boulevard option. The thing I want you to focus on, I'm going to come back to this, that there isn't hardly any difference between the existing and the hybrid. The hybrid is not the hybrid. It is not a compromise. So let me show you why. Here's the first missing piece that I believe is critical for a council to consider. The deputy city manager has prepared a very extensive, long report, better part of 100 pages with all the appendices. Yet in all my 45 years of experience as a planner, I've never seen a report that does not have a recommendation. And as you can see here, the, the, the recommendation is, city council, pick one or the other, you decide. But here's 100 pages of information. Uh, my view is that it is the obligation of city staff to at least make a recommendation. Clearly, it's up to council to decide. That's the first missing piece. Now, what does the study area look like? This is the area, a lot of people are confused about this. It's not about the entire garden. It's just from Jarvis Street over to the river and a little piece that goes out towards Logan Avenue. First Gulf is listed on the map because that's been the subject of a lot of attention. Everybody, including me, wants to see First Gulf redeveloped. And either one of these options before council, in fact, facilitates that. So there is no connection between if you only pick the hybrid, First Gulf could redevelop their lands. Both options work for First Gulf. This is a critical chart that I want you to focus on. Look at the, low, the thin blue line at the bottom. This is key. Since 1975 up until today and projecting out to 2031, the number of cars entering the central area has almost remained the same. Why? Because the hybrids were at capacity in 1975 and all the way through. The growth is clearly in the red and the green, and that's where it'll be in the future. That's transit, TTC and go. That is the only way that our central area has managed to handle the growth, and it will be especially important even more so in the future. Here's another important chart, a pie chart. And look at the Gardner East, the sort of darker blue color. Only 3% of all the people that enter the central area in the AM peak hour use the Gardner East, a little over 5,000, a very small number in the scheme of the entire big picture. Now, here's an interesting slide in terms of comparison of transit versus cars. This is an actual picture of the morning rush hour. Uh, in terms of the number of cars on the Gardner East and obviously two GO trains coming and going. The numbers on the GO train, 1,620 or roughly, the train carries 1,800 if people are at every seat and standing. The, the only way to service that congestion again is through transit, and this slide illustrates that. Here are some, I'm going to do very quickly, live City of Toronto traffic camera shots. I took for three days, Wednesday, May 20th, in the rush hour. This is on the Gardner East at Parliament Street. Here's May 20, May 21st, and May 22nd. And I think what struck me is, where are all the cars? And this is the truth. This, this is a hard truth. This piece of the Gardner is very, very lightly traveled. And that's one of the reasons why it's a candidate for a, a, a boulevard option. So that's the second. Now, this is another missing piece. This is the actual hybrid proposal that came about by First Gulf. As you can see in the solid red line, it demolished the existing gardener that runs up against the Keating Channel, moved it north against the rail corridor, freed up all that city-owned property, and freed up all the lands adjacent to the Keating Channel. That is the real hybrid. This is what is being called the hybrid. Massive difference. It is exactly the same, almost verbatim, as the existing Gardner Expressway west of the Don River. It still has the elevated uh, structure along the Keating Channel. It, it is a continuous link, no question. Uh, but east of the Don River, both options bring it down to grade as a boulevard. Here's a little more detail so you can understand. Just look at the colors. The hybrid, the new hybrid as it's being called, is the orange, the Tinos Expressway, but it's actually worse than the existing garden. Why? Look at those red lines. Those are new on and off ramps at Cherry Street that don't exist today. 
So this, in fact, maintains what's there at a cost of a billion dollars over a 100-year life cycle and adds new ramps that don't exist today. Here is the removed description on the boulevard, which I prefer to call it. Look at the colors again. The red is the expressway. And this is another myth that has to be corrected. The boulevard option has a continuous elevated connection to the Don Valley Parkway. It is not a grade with stoplights. It's continuous. The yellow, think of it as University Alley. It's the urban boulevard option. And the blue is the new waterfront access along the edge of the Keating Channel. It doesn't exist now. Here's a blow up of both. You can really see the impact of the new Cherry Street on and off ramps, the red, that in fact gobble up much of the city-owned land and, as some of you have heard, uh, in fact negatively impact the former Home Depot site, which has been the subject of a three-year uh, uh, resolution process by the owner of those lands. Uh, severely impacts their development capability. Here is the boulevard option. As you can see, fundamental difference. First thing, it opens up 12 acres of city-owned land for redevelopment which is really important as a new revenue source and continued tax revenue over the life cycle of, 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 this, of this project. Most important, I think, it opens up the water's edge promenade along the Keating Channel, because the Keating Channel is a very important uh, water body that will play a new role in the future of the Portlands and, and, and this area. Uh, it ties in directly with the new naturalization of the mouth of the Don River that the council has also approved. Again, you can see the DVT, DVT on and off ramp is maintained. It is not accepted. <coughs> Here's what it looks like in detail. Here's the hybrid versus the existing at the bottom. It's almost identical, except for a couple of little trees that are put in there. The reality is that will seal that water piece of the waterfront for the next generation in concrete rather than with landscape. And the fact is, it's a huge missed opportunity. Here is what it looks like under the boulevard option. You can see the green uh, water's edge in the Keating Channel is opened up for continuous public access across the waterfront. So all these things are very, very important. Here we get to the costs and the reports. 100-year life cycle, just under a billion dollars for the new hybrid, and 461 for the removed. The key question here is right here. What else could this city do with half a billion dollars over the life cycle? Here's three suggestions that I've made. They, that money could build the entire waterfront LRT, which is sorely needed, given all the development that's already down there, what will be coming. Or it could make a wonderful contribution and down payment to Smart Track, which I personally support. Uh, and I think it's a good concept. Or it could fix up an awful lot of the backlog of Toronto community housing repairs or a whole bunch of other ones. Point is, it's a lot of money and it needs to be carefully thought about. Here's, this, here's another missing piece, which is what I call the lack of conformity of the hybrid with the environmental assessment terms of reference. This is critical for council to understand. When the terms of reference were developed, it basically said, it's not just about a road, it's about all these things together. And there were a bunch of criteria that had to be met here they are, to reconnect the city with the lake, to revitalize the waterfront, to create a balance of travel modes, to achieve sustainability, and to create value over time, to add, not take away, in terms of the value of the proposition. My concern, and council should share this concern, that if the council does, at the end of the day, approve the hybrid, I'm very concerned that that option will not comply with the legal framework that's in the environmental terms of reference. And the minister may very well, at the end of the day, say, sorry, you didn't do what we, you were asked to do. Start all over again. So that's a missing piece. That's really critical. Here's a really powerful one. We are not alone in this discussion or in this debate. 30 cities around the world are having or have had this same discussion. Here they are. You can, you can go to, on the website. This is the Congress for New Urbanism and they document what is happening around the world. And I'm going to give you some detailed examples of places that have in fact had this discussion and have made the decision to take it down. Most of us here, I'm sure, know New York pretty well. 
Hudson River, West Side Highway. Think of it as a Gardner Expressway all along the west side from George Washington Bridge down to the tip of Manhattan. A dump truck fell through because it didn't maintain it. And they had a huge debate for decades about what to do. What did they do? That. They took it down and built a University Avenue 10-lane urban boulevard along the entire length of the Hudson River. And it works amazingly well. One of the most amazing things that most people find hard to believe is the traffic volume on that boulevard was in fact reduced. It was less than what was on the Urban Expressway. The other thing, it has it been a kickstart for the revitalization of all the waterfront access along the Hudson and is a prime address for redevelopment along that major arterial. Here's another example. San Francisco, some of you heard this, the Embarcadero Expressway, of course, was destroyed by an earthquake a long time ago. While it was lying there in ruins, I talked to the director of planning of San Francisco when I was in this job there. He said they debated it forever and they had two referendums what to do with it while it was lying there in ruins. The council voted in favor by one vote, I believe, to actually demolish it. What did they do? They took it down. That's the exact same picture today. Huge benefits in terms of increase in property value, 25 to 30 percent less traffic. Uh, city building opportunities, public realm creation, and economic revitalization. Here's a couple more. Portland, Oregon. This is one of the first ones, as you can see from the, the age of the cars here. They took that Harbor Drive down and created this, this river uh, park access with an at-grade road. Two more very quickly. Madrid, Spain, major, major uh, artery, before and after. And the last one is probably the biggest, Seoul, Korea. Uh, led by the mayor at the time, huge traffic artery, took it down, and that's what they created. They unearthed the river as well as taking the expressway down, and the at-grade roads were put on either side. The point of all this is, and I could go on and on, these are just some big examples. Cities have done this. There is nothing to fear in this discussion. It works. It, re it, it all of uh, 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 the angst that people have that we're experiencing in Toronto, uh, I, I think needs to pay attention to what these cities have done. And here's one other one. We don't have to go to Korea to look at these examples. We can go to the Garden of East. Now, when I was the chief planner under the old city of Toronto and the amalgamated city of Toronto, I was deeply involved in this discussion. This Gardner Expressway used to go all the way up to Leslie Street, with a ramp off. People came down in this very room and deputed and said, you can't do this. It'll be the end of the earth. It'll be terrible. At the end of the day, the, the amalgamated city of council, led by Mayor Lastman and a majority of council, decided, no, we're going to take it down. What was the criteria for that? It was mainly economics. It cost a lot more to keep it up than to take it down. The end result is what you see on the right-hand side. And the people, I give them full credit, that came here and said, don't do this, they actually have said to me many times, we were wrong. It works better. We like it better. The traffic flows better. It works. So we don't have to go too far to take a look at this. Now, let's go to University Avenue, because this is our best example of an urban boulevard in Toronto. I want to tell you a couple things about it. First of all, 54 meters the right of way, 10 meter wide sidewalks, four lanes in each direction, green medium down the middle. Handles 4,000 cars in the peak AM uh, hour in a two-way direction versus the 5,200 on the Gardner East. Wildly successful as a street that is now coming into its own. Let me show you a couple of examples. Lots of pedestrian life on the sidewalk next to an eight-lane boulevard. Lots of coffee shops. People having lattes next to an eight-lane boulevard. In fact, there's 11 coffee shops up and down University Avenue. Very, very safe pedestrian crossing situations. I've crossed it many times. I just tested it last week. You can cross it all in one go if you want. Many people will cross to the middle and then wait and then cross again. Point is, it works, it's safe, there's no issue. Here, contrast that with trying to cross under the gardener. First of all, it's not pleasant, it's unfriendly, but the reality is you've got fast moving traffic, cars whipping around the corners, columns in the way, you have to cross twice there to get under both of those, those bri the bridges as well. 
So here's the last slide that I want to end with. And this is, this is a really important uh, missing piece in my view. And that is the planning implications of this. I find it incredible that City Council is going to make such a momentous decision, a hundred year decision, without having any report from the chief planner of the city. Uh, that never happened when I was here. I don't think that happened with these gentlemen who were here. Are we planning for 1960 at the top when the barrier was built, or 2060? The answer should be obvious. We have to look at the future. We have to look at what is needed. And we need to consider the wider context of this evolving, totally changed waterfront that is uh, the gem, uh, uh, that, that is, that is uh, an opportunity that is in the making here. One last thing on this slide. Council, when I was chief planner, adopted unanimously, this is the Mount Lassman Council, unanimously, which never, never happens, the Making Waves Secondary Waterfront Plan. And what did that plan talk about? It talked about removing barriers, making connections, creating dynamic, diverse new, new communities, clean and green waterfront, etc. That is the guiding principles that I think Council has to follow. So just in conclusion, the bottom line is, I, I think Council has to make an evidence-based decision. There's no doubt in my mind the boulevard option is the right one to make for all these reasons that I've stated. The hybrid option would result, in my view, in building a totally new elevated waterfront expressway. And we would be the only city in the face of the earth right now doing that. We would be the laughingstock of the world. Thank you for your attention.